Hello and good morning. This is a very special episode of Hard Lens Media. You can listen to us on q4radio.org or you can listen or watch us on our Facebook live stream. And for the very first time, we are live streaming on the Hard Lens Media YouTube channel. Fingers crossed it works this week. Yes. And we have two very important special guests. Uh, first, we'll, in the first hour, will be Ugo O'Carey, who is running for the 40th Ward. He will be in our studio uh, within the next half hour. And then we also have in the second hour... Uh, Illinois State Representative Letissa Wallace, and as we all know, Letissa Wallace was the lieutenant uh, governor candidate who is with Illinois State Senator Daniel Biss. And we have a very great show again. Happy, uh, I hope everyone had a very happy 420. Um, you know, it's, uh, oh, time, yeah. times are changing. I know I had a very good 420. I think everyone did. And so first, let's get this whole story started off. Let's get this whole episode started off because it's such a really good episode today. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, North Korea. In the past, we've talked about um, the conflict that's happening there on that peninsula in that region. And the supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of North Korea, has stated as of right now that North Korea is going to halt missile and nuclear tests. And this is a huge event because basically this is the first time ever both Koreas, uh, North and South, are actually sitting down discussing peace terms and uh, also trying to push forward into uh, a bigger progress into basically having a more, I guess, safer um, trade deals with North Korea, political deals with North Korea. As we all know, there is an armistice. There, there was never any ceasefire between um, you know, North and South Korea, and this is a historic move for, for both these countries, and hopefully there can be a real peaceful solution. Uh, currently, uh, Kim Jong-un is meeting with his uh, South Korean counterpart, um, Moon Jae-in, uh, next week. And this is according to the BBC. So this is also a huge, uh, you know, like like as mentioned before, this is such a big deal that this is happening. And it'll be a first meeting between also um, President Donald Trump as well as North Korea as well, the the North Korean leader. So, Daniel, I want to get your thoughts on really what this means in the long run and if there is a peaceful solution between North and South Korea. Okay, so this is very interesting to me. So. On first, you have going with North Korea's uh, history. Of North Korea is very well known for saying one thing, going down the path like Kit is discussing, but then when it really comes down to it and uh, changes are needed to be made, they backtrack. It's a cycle that has happened with the U.S. for many, many years. Now, this is a different situation, I think. We're going to be open to it since it's all about North Korea and South Korea reuniting. Now, my question is how sincere is this again? North Korea has a very long-term policy of not meaning things like this, saying things like this, making promises and backtracking. However, in this case, you have the outside influence, which I'm sure does frighten Kim Jong-un, that is Trump and his unpredictability. (laughs) It's an interesting time when uh, a dictator is scared of someone just like them. But it's also a case that you have the South Korean leader or the president who has very strong, um, who's been very, very strong throughout his career of wanting to reunify the Koreas. So is this something that's possible? Is it something that is going to happen? It's not sure. But is this a path that is possible and a path towards peace in between two countries who have been at war with each other for about 50 years now? That's it. It's a, we don't know yet, but I think that when it comes down to it, this is something that we're going to have to keep watching because peace mm-hmm. between the Koreas would be a very helpful thing for the planet. But I think beyond that, I want to jump to our next story. Unless, Kit, you have uh, something you wanted to add. The only thing I can add on to this story, and because we have to move on to the next one, is that hopefully there, there, there can be peace to be achieved between these two nations. Um, uh, if, if conflict were ever to erupt on that peninsula, countless millions would die, and hopefully – Cooler heads are going to prevail. Hopefully the leaders of all these countries involved will have a solid peace solution, and that way we can avoid a potential crisis. So hopefully here's hoping for the best. And that being said, Daniel, we need to address this story. It has to deal with lead in our water. So lead away, man. Okay, so we've been covering the uh, lead toxicity, lead uh, and other he- heavy metals and on and off throughout the history of hard lens media because it's something that's not discussed very often. And when it is discussed, it's usually very, very lightly and then brushed away. Whereas in reality, you know, I've, I've said before that, you know, in the 60s, w- people had to worry about lead poisoning from the water, but they also had to worry about it because they were breathing it in 
all the time through leaded gasoline. It lowers your IQ, increases aggressiveness. It does all these different things. So now we have an issue where the Tribune has done uh, analyses from 2,797 homes in the last two years, and 70% of them uh, were positive, and it was unsafe in three out of ten households. Now, they did a very fair sweep across many, many different areas, but this goes to show America has just ignored its infrastructure for over 50 years. I remember under Eisenhower, we used to pay a large amount of our GDP into, I think, 5% or so, 10% into building infrastructure, fixing infrastructure, making infrastructure work better, improving it. And now we spend less than half percent. And what does that mean? It means that, and also at the same time, it used to be that the service lines, which is a very, very big deal, the service lines which connect the street access to the home, that used to be um, controlled by and owned by the government. And if that was bad, they would come and fix it. But then the government at some point was like, no, 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 you own that. You pay for it. So you can have some issues where the – like in Flint where the entire infrastructure is just decrepit, decayed, and corroded, and that's causing an issue. Or you can have instances where it's certain areas are decrepit, uh, decrepit decayed, and corroded. Like East Chicago, Indiana where well, they were built on top of a lead smelting well, factory. Well, but, that, but that's more the infrastructure than yeah. the specific area. And then you have areas like in Chicago where maybe the line to the house is good, but the lead line that connects the house to the street is old and corroded, and that's where the lead is coming from. So you have all these different points where lead can get into the body. And we've talked before the innate dangers of having lead in your system. Growing up, it lowers your IQ, increases aggressiveness. I mean it does so much – to make someone's potential so much less yeah. in a way that it would be entirely preventable if we decided to put the money toward it. But financial industries are more important. So with that being said, this our test results they have shouldn't surprise anyone. I mean we've known of the reporting. We've talked about how there is lead contamination everywhere. It's predominantly in areas that are um, – Minority, minor- work, working class communities. Right, working class communities, minorities, people that don't have money. But it is also – richer neighborhoods because we just haven't been spending money on infrastructure in general. So it applies across the board, but it's concentrated and it's worse in those areas where people are poorer because, as you know, the amount of money you make in the U.S. is a direct correlation to how much service and how much infrastructure and how much health you're going to receive, how much care you're going to receive from a city. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that if there is a lead issue in the city that it's going to be worst in areas with people that have the least and the most to lose from lead poisoning because at least if you're wealthy you can do mitigating actions you can do you know you know once lead's in the body it's in the body but you can do things that make it the effects of it um less uh noticeable less severe that you could never afford in the areas that it's worst you know this is uh neoliberalism 101 let's you know Let's remember, Chicago is a hyper-segregated city. So in the rich neighborhoods, like you mentioned, Daniel, the people in those communities can at least, you know, take care of themselves, take care of their family, and also get – at least the political figures are going to go in those areas first to address the crisis. However, let's talk about the low-income minority working class communities, especially on the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago. These are predominantly African-American, Latino communities, also some Caucasian neighborhoods as well. But the thing is is that – this infrastructure is so decrepit, so inept, and so out of date that countless thousands are being affected by it. And, you know, Daniel, you said it before on the show that there's no safe amount of lead that should be in the human body. And let's remember, um, this, this hazardous material should not be in our drinking water. And the fact that it is, the fact that our city government, our county government, the state government, and even at the, to a large extent, the federal government is turning a blind eye to this and isn't really com- doing much action towards it. It goes to show you where these political figures stand and why so many people are upset at our elected officials and why there's such a this huge distrust between the populace and those that are supposed to govern and look out for our best interests. Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean drinking water. The people of East Chicago, Indiana um, – at, at certain ages, they, they are dealing with hysterectomies or dangerous forms of cancer or other developmental issues. And now here, the city of Chicago, a proud bastion, a metropolitan city, 
now has lead in its water too. And so what's a proper response that the city government's going to do? Well, probably nothing until we do something in 2019. And remember, this city government, Mayor Rahm Emanuel's administration, the Cook County elected officials, and even the city uh, government elected officials, you know what they're doing? They're in bed with the large real estate developers. And when these large real estate developers move in to these low-income minority communities, what do they do? Gentrification 101. Displace the population, get all the people out, close down the schools, tear everything down, rebuild it at a higher price, and then invite rich people from well affluent communities. So thus, thus the crisis is evolved, but you know is is resolved. But what happens to the people who were affected by the lead in the water? Probably nothing. And this also goes down to health care here in this country too. Because remember, I've said it before, and you've said it before, Daniel too. One bad day, you could lose your job. You could lose your house and everything else. And these medical bills are ridiculous here in this country. We don't have uh, single-payer health care in this country. And these, uh, what, what lead does to the human body, it's long-term effects. It's not going to go away. Daniel said it uh, so many times. Once lead is in the body, it's not going anywhere. I mean, you're a lead contractor, Daniel. I mean, let's, let's uh, let the audience know. What is the correct safe amount of lead that should be in the water? Well, none, obviously, because what it does is, again, to go back, it takes especially – it hits all parts of the body. Um, we were just learning recently that it also hits the heart, cardiovascular system. But mm-hmm. the big real issue is – also goes into your bones and will leach out a whole other issue. But it really affects the nervous system because lead, the way the atomic structure of lead is, it replaces calcium – in the ion channels that are used by the nerves, which usually use a calcium and sodium channel that allows your body to think. It's the ability for your neurons to move information around, and lead just deadens that connection. Now, I want to go back to what's happening within the city. Yeah. So now we've dealt with this before. When I was in uh, Flint, when we were in East Chicago, when the EPA does a water test, they don't go do it normally. Like when you – okay, so like Kit, when you want to get a glass of water, I'll take for myself, when I get a glass of water – I go to the sink, I turn the water on, then I put the glass under it, and I fill the water up, and then I drink it. The EPA, when they do their testing, they go, okay, we're going to turn it on. Now we're going to wait five minutes. Okay, now we're going to test the water after whatever has been sitting there has been flushed out from the service lines of the house, and they get a better, more a street. It's, it's, a, it's a cheap way to do it. The EPA, we've seen everywhere that we've done, they've done that kind of testing. It's very underhanded. It's very sneaky because it's not using the water in a fashion that citizens use the water in. They don't count. When it's hotter, lead is more active because it, it has, there's more energy pushing it to, uh, to the tap. And people don't wait five minutes after they turn their water in. To use it, and then the filters, like we were dealing with in East Chicago and Flint, when they give out filters, they forget to mention the filters are useless as soon as you apply hot water to them. So as soon as you apply hot water to them, they become useless. They actually break and they don't work for subsequent uses. So this again goes to people are putting on band aids to artery artery wounds, and so and that will always what, work out, right? And so what happens? What think? Okay, if you are. If you're coming at this from a economic point of view, which is like what the Schneiders claim to be – of the world claim to be doing was they – he just said, oh, the water's fine even though the water's still not fine. Um, well, what's the – what is the cost of lowering the IQ of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people throughout a city? And giving making, them debilitating health diseases giving too. Giving them debilitating health diseases, making them less productive, making them angrier. Um what is the economic cost of having a less well-run workforce? I say it is far beyond whatever it would cost to repair these systems. We're talking billions of dollars. I mean, if you just look in how much uh, sick days cost the economy, it's all these numbers that are never talked about dwarf the numbers that these the, – the issues that they cause. So it's like – Hey, we don't want to inflict. We don't want to fix, put in fifty-four or what is it, fifty-four million dollars to fix a water system because it might have a return over thirty years of I don't know a quarter billion dollars, if not more, of people's health right. going up. Because we're on, we're you know, the government is as we know run by corporations. So as you would expect, we run on a quarterly system of returns, not an actual how a country should run on a. Okay, how is this going to work 20 years down the line? If yeah. I make an investment right now that costs a lot, will it pay off in dividends? Will it pay off well three months from now or 20 years from now? Yeah, I just want to end this statement too. Well, end this story with this statement. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to stutter on that one. 
I want everyone to pay attention. If you live in the city of Chicago or Cook County, this should anger you because our city officials, our Cook County elected officials, our state officials need to do their job and fix this problem. And if, whoever these new candidates are of running for the 2018 midterm, 2019, 2020, if, if, whoever, if, if you are upset and you want to step up and get involved, now's the time to offer solutions because our current government isn't offering enough. And all of us here in the Chicago, city of Chicago, Cook County area, we're all affected by this. We are all in this together. I don't care what neighborhood you live in. This is going to affect every single one of us. And if you live in a rich community or if you live, let's say, in an area that doesn't have any lead in its water, don't wait up. It will get to you soon enough. This is the time where now all of us have to get politically involved. We all have to hold our elected officials accountable and call them up. So if you live, if, if, if you get involved or if you want people to get involved, call, you know, get together. Call up your elected officials. Ask them where they stand on this issue. Ask them what they're going to do. And also, I want everyone in the city of Chicago, Cook County, to take a good long look at Lake Michigan, too, because in the state of Indiana, there is a laissez-faire policy in which we have these large industrial factories and steel mills that are pouring in, quote-unquote, regulated toxic waste into our water. We use water to clean our food, wash ourselves, wash our clothes. If we can't use it, we're, we're, what, what kind of society are we living in? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's neoliberalism, and neoliberalism is basically functioning feudalism for the top 1%. And to the top 1%, don't wait up. It's going to get to you too. Now's the time where we have to get actively involved. Now's the time where you have to hold your elected officials accountable, and now's the time for all of us as a country, as a people, to really protect our clean drinking water, to protect our environment, because if we don't have it, we're not going to have anything very soon. I want to give actually a really good analogy Kit made uh, before the show started about how bad this dumping is in Indiana. And again, Indiana, just as a point of uh, context, it's in East Chicago because even though it's in Indiana, the state, it's basically part of Chicago, the city. So a lot of what happens in East Chicago is, is due directly to Chicago. So even though it's across state lines, the state lines are important because, as Kit said, it's much more laissez-faire. It's some of the worst or laxest environmental regulations that there are. And it's just not the steel mills either. Oh, no. Yeah, they have a whole, whole – you can see our previous reports on that. But the, Kit made a really good analogy, which was it's as if for the Indiana laws, if I have a gallon of urine that I'm just holding – and I want to give it to you as drinking water, you're going to say, oh, no, that's terrible. But Indiana would say, just mix in 10 gallons of fresh water with it, and then it will be drinkable. That's the same exact thing that they're doing with heavily toxic. Uh, we're going to talk about that in future episodes a little more with, yeah. the, with the chromium releases and the other pollutants that are there. That That's the... That's how they. That's how. That's what when Kit says regulated waste. That's what he means. Is that Indiana is like, hey, you can't put those toxic materials in the water. You gotta mix them with water first. Yeah. So, so. we got. So we got a big one-two punch that's happening to our uh, drinking water we get from the pipes, as well as from our the largest fresh body of water here in the, in, in the world, Lake Michigan. So if this is something that concerns you, if this is something that angers you, now's the time to call up your elected officials, no matter where they're at, and hold them accountable. Ask them what they're going to do because. Lead is in, once lead is in your body, it's not going anywhere. There's no magical solution. Now's the time for us as a people, again, to step up. And if you don't step up, well, then you're going to be on the menu. So that being said, we're going to move on to another story. And uh, it, it's uh, related. A little, a little bit on a nicer note. Yeah, a little bit on a nicer note. Um, and it actually shows you uh, where this country is moving in regards to uh, cannabis. So like I mentioned before earlier in the episode, I hope everyone had a very great and happy 420 because now – Potential Democratic uh, 2020 contenders are rushing to back cannabis legalization. Now, we all know Bernie Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont was already for cannabis legalization. That shouldn't surprise anyone. But during the 2016 primary, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was hesitant of removing cannabis as a um, – because you got to take yeah, care of those yeah. super predators. Yeah, yeah. She, she was uh, hesitant of removing it from the Controlled Substances Act. So it doesn't surprise me because the Clinton and the DNC establishment are neoliberals. I mean, and, 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 they're, and they're, they're in bed with the, yeah, with the for-profit yeah, uh, prison the, the industry. Privet industri the priv they, they, make, they give them a lot of money. They have, you know, it's just important that they listen very carefully to what they say mm -hmm. and take it seriously because they don't want to be primaried. Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing. I'm, I'm noticing a lot of these Democratic contenders that are, uh, you know, getting involved into supporting um, 
you know, cannabis legalization, it's it, it's very convenient for them now because now they're realizing that, oh, wait, we could get a lot of people to vote uh, for us and support us if we back this very popular idea. It's like prohibition. Listen, in the first year d- during the during the uh, prohibition era of 19 uh, from the late 1920s up to the 1930s, prohibition in its first year was successful. But then what happened afterwards? Crime was happening. People were making illegal booze. And it, it came to the point where it was just a failed child morality act that wasn't going to accomplish anything. People wanted to drink. You were denying them the freedom to drink alcohol. That's so stupid. And the same thing with cannabis. Cannabis is harmless. Can I say, cannabis, cannabis has for 3,000 years of Earth's history been welcome and accepted throughout history. Just the last 75 that have been an issue. Here in the United States. But, you know, it, it, it goes to show you uh, that the war on drugs – was the dumbest thing that this country ever did. And let's remember, the hey, war hey, on drugs... Some, hey, some prison officials made a lot of money. Well, that is true. Because the for-profit prison industry mostly targets, uh, you know, like I said before, low-income communities, minority communities, working-class communities. And at the end of the day, cannabis is harmless. They're, you're, going to, you're always going to hear from these people who say that cannabis is a, a dangerous uh, opening a in, drug. But here in the country in right reality, now— In reality, cannabis is a gateway drug out of dependency. Yeah. It be, is used by people that are on heroin, that are on— other, Opioids, which, other, which is a serious what, crisis. Or, or on the pr- people that are prescribed opioids that abuse them that go to heroin use cannabis to get off heroin. Yeah. So if that's a gateway drug, that's the best gateway one could ask for. Yeah. And at this point— and in uh, very strict numbers, about 60 percent of the U.S. population agrees with this and has agreed with it for and, a while. And it's, and it's increasing. Look, let, let's, uh, let's also look back. Let's rewind back the clocks to the great state of Colorado when they had uh, finally legalized cannabis as, as a recreational use uh, in their state. At first and foremost, uh, a lot of the conservative areas and even oh, most no, of the country— Oh, no, kids are going to use it. There's going to be car crashes everywhere. Kids are going to start turning into demons. Yeah, there, there's, there's going to be an increase in crime. But what happened? Oh, all of a sudden they started earning money, and all these conservative districts in Colorado all of a sudden were earning money. They wanted Crime more of it. went down. Youth, youth use went down. Yep. Everything that they predicted, the opposite happened. And, and on top of that, here's something that's very foreign to the state of Illinois. Colorado started having a budgetary surplus to where they were giving refunds back to their citizens. I'm pretty sure anyone who's living in our state would really like to have cannabis legalized in our state, and it can be. There's Senate Bill 316 and House Bill 2353. Call up your local state uh, officials in the House and Senate here in Springfield and ask them where they stand on Senate Bill 316 and House Bill 2353. So uh, I just I just want to move back to the story, though, real quick. I find it's convenient that a lot of the establishment Democratic leaders are starting to uh, loosen up their 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 hard stance on um, cannabis. And, but and but, also, but, 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 but my criticism say, they're of this, also doing it at a time when they have no power to enact any of this. Yes, but I I, I do find it uh, I, I'm going to be a little critical of the uh, Democratic establishment because. Okay, they're on board for cannabis legalization and at the recreational level, right? But what are you going to do about all the prisoners who are in jail for holding a bag of cannabis? What or or what are you going to do about all those nonviolent offenders? Because once you legalize cannabis, it's sort of like anyone who's behind bars is like, well, I had a bag of cannabis on me, now it's legal. Why am I still in jail? What do you, Democratic establishment? What are you going to do about that now? We've heard Senator Bernie Sanders state in the past that, hey, we got to do something for those people in there. See, there's one person from the Democratic Party that I and believe we, and we, it's Senator Bernie Sanders because he at least has the knowledge to realize that, okay, once we legalize cannabis, what are we going to do about the people that are behind bars? What are we going to do about – We would have states – yeah. not states, cities like San Francisco where we covered recently where yeah. they are actually letting people – I think one thing that would be nice is with all the money that cannabis gets from taxes, if there was some either, – either for the federal or state prisons – that maybe 10% of the – there's a 10% tax on all cannabis federally. And then yeah. if, if you were put in jail for five years for, for smoking cannabis, when you get out, you get paid this part of the surplus. Like it's spread evenly by people that were in there yeah. for, for five years. You know, And again, too, adding on to what Daniel mentioned as well, that the fact that the Democrats are now doing this at a time when they don't have power – the 2018 midterm uh, general election cycle will be the interesting point where what, what's going to happen in 2020. And if the Democrats successfully get enough seats uh, for this uh, midterm election cycle, will they start uh, actually enacting on a lot of these promises of legalizing cannabis? Will they actually go forward on it? Because the thing is, a lot of people want cannabis to be legalized. It's, it's getting to the point to where uh, I can now see where people were – 
how people were acting during the ending days of the Prohibition to where it's like, no, people want to have their booze, their wine, their beer. Look, I can't eat Italian food with grape juice. I need fine red wine. I don't care. You deny that for me. Of course I'm going to break the law so I can get a nice bottle of red wine to eat some nice Italian food. I will fight you, okay? And there's, there's a really good point <laughs> someone made that for a number of years, in most of the U.S. at least, if – you are Caucasian. It has been made legal yeah. for a number of years unofficially, and it's, it'll be nice that we have a country where those laws apply evenly across the board where it is. And I want to know where the Democrats yeah. are going to stand on this, and especially during the yeah. 2020 presidential election cycle. I know where Senator Bernie Sanders is going to stand on this issue, but I'm quite curious where a good old Joe Biden or any other neoliberal establishment candidate is going to stand on helping out the minority uh prisoners in jail what are they going to do for them because something has to be done because as soon as you legalize cannabis at the national level as soon as cannabis is off the controlled substance act what's going to happen to the people behind bars because then then this then there's a very important point of where do we stand with our people where do we stand with uh the people who are who are who are losing most of their uh youth behind bars see this whole war on drugs was nothing but a way to target People of color, people who thought politically differently than the neoliberal Nick, I establishment. I want to say that I want to quote yeah. Nixon's aide when he said yeah. when Go he ahead. said that the reason that we did it is because our two main political rivals were the hippies that were that were protesting us and the blacks that were protesting us. So we made heroin and uh, was it, I know I'm butchering the quote. We made heroin and marijuana illegal, and then we pushed them. Uh, every night on the news, so it, it was it was always done politically. Now I want to because we only have a few minutes left. I want to jump very quickly to yeah. one story I really wanted to cover, which was this very interesting uh, expose by the Intercept on how the restaurant industry. I love always love it when these kind of things happen. Uh, where the restaurant industry did a secret poll on its own about trying to figure out through its um, you know done by right wing pollsters. I think it was actually Frank Luntz that actually did that, and. Um, Trying to figure out would people be would people that go to restaurants be happy to continue going to restaurants if the food prices were raised if the workers were paid an increased minimum wage and seventy one percent of the people I remember this is going to be phrased in a way that is the most um, negative towards raising the minimum wage and seventy one percent of people thought it should be increased. In, and this poll got leaked. And if you know that if the restaurant industry does a poll that's right-leaning and 71% of people still support it, people want the minimum wage to increase. We haven't increased it for so long for as, as for as a, um, adjusting for cost of living, adjusting for inflation. Every year, the 725 actually gets less and less valuable. I mean, in the 50s, 725 would be a ridiculous wage. I mean, that would be that your middle class, your upper middle class, you can get, <laughs> get paid 725 an hour. Oh man, that guy's making it. But today, you can barely get more than 11 inches of sandwich with yeah. that much because it's you have to remember then you have taxes are pulled out of it. Yeah, and like I, we spoke when I was working at Overrice, it was like, oh, we're going to give you minimum wage. For your training, but then we're going to pull a dollar out of your hourly pay for training purposes for 90 days for a job that you're only going to get for three months. So there's so many ways around it. And what it comes down to, if you live in a consumer economy like we do in the U.S., like many com countries do, because we go by capitalism, you need people to buy things for the system to function. And if you don't give people money to buy things for the system to function, the system slowly collapses like it is now. Yeah, no one to leave those big uh, geniuses in uh, Wall Street, the banks and the corporations to enact policies that's not only uh, affect us but also shoot them in the foot. That's why we need to have some regulations. That's why we need to have reform into our government. And that's why we need new elected officials to step up and actually help out and represent the people. And that being said, I am proud and honored to introduce – our first guest for the uh, half hour, sir, can you please introduce yourself to our audience and the people who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook? Hi, everyone. My name is Ugo Carey, and I'm candidate for Alderman of the 40th Ward. Thank you so much for having me, Kit. So we've interviewed you in the past, and uh, you've been actively involved in some protests as well as uh, you know, getting your name out there on the street of Chicago. Exactly. Uh, can you explain to our audience 
where you're running, I know you're running in the 40th Ward, yeah. but wh why did you uh, start to get actively involved in politics? Why, why are you doing this now at this point? Sure. So uh, about the 40th Ward in general, so it encompasses multiple neighborhoods, mm -hmm. Ravenswood, Lincoln Square, uh, parts, of, uh, parts of Edgewater, parts of West Ridge, mm -hmm. a very small portion of Rogers Park. Uh, you know, I've been in the ward since I was nine years old. I'm 22 now, and uh, it, it's been it's been a beautiful place, and it's you know where I came to see the world. It's mm -hmm. where I grew up. It's where you know it's it's the friends that I've made there. It's the family members that I've that I've come to love and cherish that live in the 40th ward alongside me that really make it the place that it is. And you know, I'm running because we have we've we've woken up we've woken up to the fact that our debts and obligations in this city are balanced on the backs of the marginalized and oppressed and working class residents of the city of chicago i'm running because we've seen with our own eyes that chicago public schools is not only segregated by race but it's also segregated segregated by class mm -hmm. And I'm also running because I want to make sure that the black and brown communities in the city of Chicago are not fearful of the Chicago Police Department because they have been for quite some time in this city. And so I'm running because I want to make sure our schools are funded equitably. I'm running because I want black and brown folks like myself to feel safe. And I'm running because I want to make sure that millionaires and billionaires in the city pay their fair share. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we all know that you know here in the city of Chicago we have a lot of issues that are affecting our uh, city. And the thing is it's – at the end of the day, we have to look at neoliberalism. Neoliberalism mm -hmm. is the problem. So growing up here in Chicago, um, what have you noticed, uh, any kind of changes in regards to your community? And how did neoliberalism as a whole – because I think a lot of people like don't really understand what neoliberalism is. Mm -hmm. What have you noticed in regards to how it's really been impacting the working class communities here in this city? Sure. So for folks who um, aren't, aren't particularly aware, because, again, neoliberalism is uh, – neoliberal – the term neoliberalism, the term is sometimes can be viewed as inaccessible. Mm -hmm. And so we, can, we have to break that down as to what that actually means. And so neoliberalism, as I see it, is a system of running government, of running the economy in which we are focusing on the privatization of public industries. We're focusing on making sure that we gouge and squeeze as much as we can out of the public and invest it into private hands. And so we see that uh, in the Chicago in Chicago public schools. I grew up in Chicago public schools. I uh, went there for I uh, went to Budlong Elementary School. Went to Lane Tech afterwards. Uh, and you know what I saw in Chicago public schools was the rampant disinvestment from first of all neighborhood schools in the city of Chicago, and especially schools in the south and west sides of Chicago. If you grew up and you went to a uh, you know a neighborhood school in the city of Chicago, you probably uh, remember having very large class sizes. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you probably have a class size of 35 plus uh, of kids who are who are looking for the attention of their teachers, but can't exactly find it because we're overburdening teachers, we're underpaying teachers. What we're doing is we're gouging the system, and we're saying, "Hey, you can do more with less." Every single day, we are taking more and more away from our Chicago public school students, and we're we're expecting them to do more with less. While we while we overfund while we overfund you, you know these 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 large these large companies these large corporations in the city of Chicago and and for me personally you know it, it really pains me to see every single day the way that we treat our schools in the south and west sides of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mayor Rahm Emanuel and his administration closed fifty schools in twenty twelve. 50 schools, and he's planning on closing another four in the next three years. And all of them are located in Inglewood. Exactly. All of them are located in, in, in Inglewood. To me, it shows that he does it. he's not here. He's not here for Chicago Public Schools. He's not here for the future of the education of the students in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I can't, I cannot, to me, it, it's, it's ridiculous that we, there's even a chance that he could be reelected in 2019. Because what we need to do is focus on making sure that every single student in the city of Chicago has a quality education, mm -hmm. has an education that is not going to be up in the air in the next few years, mm -hmm. an education that is well, equitably, and exceptionally funded in the city of Chicago. And so that's where I really see neoliberalism impacting the city at, at its core. It's the way that we treat our students, and it's the way that we treat education in the city. Now, I think it's very important to also point out to our audience, because I think you know, for for a long time, people are uninformed of what certain government offices do, or, or mm -hmm. what they contribute towards the the greater part of our city government, Cook County government. So, what does the office of the 40th Ward effectively do 
And should you be elected, what powers do you intend on using in order to bring reform and actually social justice uh, towards the people in your district? Sure. So the way that I look at the uh, the, the role of alderman is, is really in two parts. At number one, you're a steward of your ward. You're making sure everyone in the ward gets the things that they need from filling potholes to making sure that street lights are up we need and running. That. Yes, at, at, the, at, the, at the base. We make sure that you know our potholes are covered, our street lights are, are on, and, and infrastructure in the ward is developed and maintained and cared for. Uh, on the other hand, you're also a you're also a representative for the city of Chicago in City Hall. Every vote that you cast, every ordinance that you um, that you're working in working in the committees is going to affect the entire city of Chicago. And so, in that sense, you are also representative for the city. You know, if elected, one of the two things that I really want to focus on for my ward in particular are community-driven zoning process and participatory budgeting. Mm -hmm. So, for folks who don't know about participatory budgeting, that's when that's the um, every year uh, aldermen get one point three million dollars in in funds that can go to infrastructure in the ward. Right now, certain aldermen, like Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa, Alderman John Arena of the uh, of the of the forty fifth ward use participatory budgeting to allow a democratic process for residents of the ward to decide where that $1.3 million is going rather than it just being the aldermen themselves. And for me, it's a way to allow uh, participation in our local government and bringing folks into the political process to say, hey, your input matters here. Let's bring, let's, let's have you come and sit, like, give us your ideas so that we can make sure that we bring you the things that you want. So participatory budgeting is something that's really important to me. Also, a community-driven zoning process. Alderman Carlos Ramirez Ross of the 35th Ward currently institutes this in his ward, and it's, it, what it will, it would allow is to make sure that the residents of our ward get to decide what kind of businesses and developments come into the ward. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be used to stop, to curb things like gentrification, and it can be used to make sure that the, the areas that communities live in are the kinds of communities that they want to live in. So a particular story I have around that, I was knocking doors the other day in the 40th Ward, and uh, one of the houses that we went up to, recently there was a gigantic uh, car dealership that was just built uh, at, the, at a, one of the edger, one of the you know parts in the edge of the ward. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge building. It blocks out sunlight. It, it it makes the alleyway behind the homes that were that are there currently uh, like a mess to navigate. It makes people feel you know. They, they feel stifled because of this huge building. And it's, an, it's not the nicest building either. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was knocking on doors and I was t talking to, to one of the people that lived in a home that was right behind that building, they told me, yeah, my biggest concern is that building right behind me. It just sprouted out of nowhere. It's making the alleyways a mess. It's, uh, it's blocking out sunlight. It's just an, it's an eyesore in the community. And I, and I was like, did, did you guys have like a hearing at the, on this? Like, did, was there a town hall? Was, was anybody invited in the process? They said no. No one was invited into this process, but their community was changed unilaterally for them. And something like a community-driven zoning process would stop that from ha happening because the community gets to decide, is this something we really want? And so from what I heard, it's not what the community wants. You know, here's the thing. I think a lot of people want to know then, who is the current incumbent in that ward? And uh, what kind of challenges have you received in regards to getting your name on the ballot and getting your name out there so that people can actually uh, vote you in or, or, if, or in order for you to bring these types of reforms in? Mm -hmm. So the current um, so the current alderman there is Alderman Patrick O'Connor. He has been there since 1983, so wow. uh, 30 plus years. Not that long. No, yeah, <laughs> course, not in Chicago. Um, for you know, he's been there for 30 plus years, and his his entire tenure has been he has been the mayor's floor leader for every single mayor except for one. Mayor Harold Washington. And that was because he was sitting on the Verdoliac 29, an almost all-white voting block against the first black mayor of the city of Chicago. And since then, he stood um, side by side with, uh, all, uh, with Mayor Daley when he sold off our parking meters to a foreign company. He stood next to Rob Emanuel when uh, you know, he closed 50 schools in the city of Chicago and planning on closing another four. And, and to me, you know, we're just starting out. So we, we announced our campaign in January, and we've been, we've been getting a, a ton of press because of that. You know, I'm, I'm, you know we, this is a young campaign. This is a democratic socialist campaign as well. And so it's catching a lot of attention. And, you know, we got covered in the Chicago Defender um, a few days after our, um, you know, our announcement. We got covered in, in multiple media outlets. And so it, it's, been, it's, been, it's been good in terms of getting our names out there and talking to folks in the ward. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not going to raise as much money as the incumbent. We're not going to raise $200,000, $300,000 in, in our war chest. But that's because we don't need to do that. One of the fortunate things about running in an election that's this local is that what's going what's to win us, what's going to have us win is being at the doors, is talking to people about issues that they care about and making sure that we can, uh, we can knock on every single door in the ward. You know, 
there have been other there have been other aldermanic candidates who have uh, who've who've actually used this strategy and also won. And so I plan on doing the exact same thing. All right, uh, re- real quick, real quick, um, because I, I'm all of a sudden thinking back to the March 20th primary. Um, it was. For the most part, sadly, a 3% turnout of millennial and young people votes. Mm-hmm. So what lessons did you learn from that primary? Uh, what, what are you going to improve upon? And how are you going to bring out a, a large turnout uh, in your ward when it comes time to vote you in or the incumbent in, who's been in for 30-plus years, to really get uh, you on, onto the seat? So uh, what, what's your plan of outreach? What lessons did you learn from the uh, March 20th primary? And how are you going to get people actively involved in – to not only uh, support you, but to vote you in and actually to be there when the polls do open. Sure. So I've actually talked to some, I'm a millennial myself, of course, but yeah. uh, you know, I've talked to other millennials about the reasons that they actually did not go in to vote, why they, why they skipped this extremely important uh, March 20th election. And it was because a lot of them had very low voter information about what was going on, about the actual primary. And, you know, some folks can say, well, you can go out and find out the information yourself. It's all on the Internet. It's all available. But we have to remember the way that politics is done and the way that politics has historically been done. We've taken the same exact 10,000. If you're in an aldermanic election, you've taken the same exact 10,000 um, voters. You go knock on their door and you say, hey, are you voting for me? Hey, are you voting for me? Hey, are you voting for me? Because these are likely voters. You know they're going to come out in the next election. So that's where you're focusing all your time Mm -hmm. but the majority of chicago wards have around fifty thousand plus people in them and so if you're only focusing on 10 or twenty thousand people you are leaving a ridiculously large amount of people out of the political process because you don't deem them you know useful enough to your campaign or useful enough to your political process and so for us what we're going to try to do is actually talk to those people when you're talking to folks about issues that matter to them, it's a lot easier to bring them to the polls rather than just talking about a bunch of things that mattered about 10,000 people and then saying, hey, all the rest of you, come out and vote for me. No, let's go to them. Let's ask them what they care about. Talk about it. Include it in our campaign and in our issues and then say, hey, you are, we want you to be invested in this because your life is ultimately going to be changed because of the work that we're doing here. So for me, it's really about engaging people who have historically been left out of the political process, bringing them into it and helping them and co-governing alongside them to build a future that works for all of us, not just a handful of millionaires and billionaires. Sounds, I, I hear a little bit of uh, nostalgia when you say that. Mm. So I want to know, this is actually, this, this race has actually been... A lot of people are joining this race. I'd like you to go just who else is running in the race and then further to the point you just made, what would be your strategy to win those voters? Because it's not like uh, going to every house is going to be the only way you can reach them. Are mm-hmm. you going to be going to schools and holding uh, – uh, just holding town rallies, halls. Ta- yeah. town halls? Are you going to be outside trying to get people to sign up to vote? What's, gonna, mm-hmm. what's it going to turn into? Sure. So with your first question was who else is in the who else is in the race? Oh, yeah, sure. So we have um, officially, you know, the a woman who ran in the last election, um, Diane Dow, the, the light in against um, Patrick O'Connor. So she's running. Maggie O'Keefe, uh, she, um, also running for the race, and then Andre Vasquez, and then and there's myself, and then the incumbent has not officially declared that he's going to be running again, but we can. You know, him being the mayor's floor leader and him being there since 1983, I am not surprised if he decides to jump back in the race again. And just really quickly, what are the political leanings of all the other people running? Everyone um, in the in the race so far identifies as a progressive. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Um, and to your to your question about you know how exactly are we going to do other than knocking on every door? Is we so far so far we've been hosting listening sessions too. We've been asking people from the neighborhood to come in to share you know what it is that they want to see, how we're exactly we're going to co-govern alongside each other and build a future that's equitable and, and that's you know that invests in places that need it the most. Uh, we've gotten some really good responses about, you know, how folks feel about the Cop Academy, how folks feel about, you know, gardening, gardening and beekeeping initiatives in the ward and, and, and investing in local schools as well. Uh, we're, we're planning on hosting um, or planning on, you know, having more and more town halls to, to get people's feedback about, again, things that they want they want to see and what they want to do. But really, it's going to be the grind of knocking on doors and talking to people. And, uh, yeah, I, I have no qualms about going to schools, no qualms about going to um, community community spaces and, and just showing up everywhere in the world because I think that's something that, you know, I've heard in the, uh, in the listening sessions that we've had is that folks want an alderman that's accessible. They want an alderman that they see out in the community, and that's something that we don't have in the 40th Ward. So they want to know, like, they, they're going go to go to a community event, and they're going to see their alderman there. They, they're going to go to this, um, this neighborhood potluck or something, and they, they're going to see their alderman there. Uh, and so that's something that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be everywhere all at once. And uh, that's, that's, that's part of how we're going to win this campaign. 
That's that's really good because like I think we really need to see more people get actively involved, and hopefully there will be a much more larger turnout, especially for this municipal 2019 election cycle. Because mm-hmm. look, Chicago, we're suffering from lead in our water right now, and countless other issues that are affecting our city. And the important thing for 2019 is we need people to stand up, get involved, and get out there to vote. So I think real quick, um, I, I know that we we're, we're going to be entering into our second break, but l- I want from, from we our have, audience. We have yeah, like we, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got we have 15 minutes. Oh, oops. Oh, all right. My bad. My bad. Uh, sorry about that. All right. So I think uh, real quick, though, um, you, you one of your issues that you're talking about is like environmental justice. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean for this uh, for your campaign? Like and how how will it affect the people here in the city of Chicago? Because for a long time, I think we've ignored our environment, our clean water, our clean air. What, what, what type of reform are you going to bring in? Because right now, uh, we mentioned in the first hour, lead is in our water. Mm-hmm. What do you plan on doing? So environmental justice to me is really about making sure that we don't forget that there's an intersection between environment, race, and class. Mm-hmm. As you all were talking about earlier in the segment about you know the, the apportionment of lead in, in the city of Chicago's water and where that actually hits the hardest. It's go like, you know, we're seeing it in all across the city, but it's, it's major, it's going to be majority in the black and brown communities in the city of Chicago and environmental justice to me is about making sure that we are taking care of our environment and we're taking care of our environment in a keen, in a very keen and very specific way that makes sure that we are lifting the boats of those who are most marginalized and oppressed. And so I'm not surprised at all that there is a, a, a huge amount of lead in, the, in Chicago's water on the south and west side of, of Chicago. But what I am extremely surprised about, mm, surprised, shocked, or more so, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Disgusted. Is the way that this uh, administration, the city's administration, and the, and the city's administration's allies in the city council are treating this issue. So as, as folks know, there was a city council meeting recently where uh, actually our opponent, Alderman Patrick O'Connor, sidelined a hearing that aldermen were calling on to make sure that they could, hear, they, they could find out how extensive the issue of lead in our water is in Chicago. And to me, that shows that the city is far more concerned, the city and our, and our opponent, is far more concerned with saving face, with making the city look good, rather than it is about saving the lives of the people who are working class, black and brown, and who are being affected by this particular issue. And so, to me, if if I was in that seat, I would have been calling for a hearing alongside those ald- other aldermen to make sure that we can find the extent to which lead is in our water and find out how exactly we're going to tackle that to make sure we can have a lead-free city, because that is, at the end of the day, what we need to be fighting for. It's a lot harder to attract uh, middle and upper class Caucasians to your city as a new tech hub when you have uh, lead in your water. Yeah, because let's all remember, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and all of his allies in the Cook County and city government are jumping over backwards, bending over backwards, uh, doing whatever they can to get Amazon to come into our city. And the last thing I think uh, Amazon wants to hear is, oh, your city has lead in its water? I I don't want to go there. At at the end of the day, you know— I'm not motivated by, you know, capital coming into the city in terms of, you know, we are doing everything that we can to try to bring this multi-billion dollar company into the city of Chicago. Yeah. While we have folks who are starving on the streets in the city of Chicago who are looking to find safe havens from violence, police violence, who are looking to make sure that they can live an economically prosperous life. And we're throwing our money in the direction of People who have billions of dollars who frankly don't need it. To me, this is corporate welfare. It's ridiculous that we are spending millions upon millions upon billions of dollars to try to bring a a company that is only going to give what? 50,000 jobs. And these aren't going to be good quality jobs. These aren't going to be long term jobs. Um, It's. To me, it's disgusting. We could be investing in places that need it the most, in our neighborhood schools, in Chicago public schools in general, in making sure that our infrastructure, our, our lead pipe, our pipes are not filled with lead, making sure that, you know, folks have a chance, an actual decent chance at a prosperous life in the city of Chicago. And to me, Amazon is not going to be the thing that gets us there. I agree 100%. And I, and even, but even going along that line, if the city wants to do a, a tech line, why don't they just get people in the city and actually teach 
computer skills in schools. I mean, that seems like a rather straightforward yeah. way to keep convert. the public schools open yeah. and, and everything else. I, I, I can't help but remember back when we were live streaming the, the Inglewood debate or the Inglewood conversation in regards to keeping those four schools open. One student said, if these schools are so bad, why are the teachers, students, and families fighting so hard to keep them open? So I want to ask you this, though, that, and this is an issue that's affecting all of Chicago, and that's the TIF funds, mm -hmm. okay? Are, what, what would be your policy in really holding this administration and this city council and, this, and Cook County uh, accountable in regards to the TIF funds so that they could finally be redistributed back into the struggling communities where those TIF funds can actually keep those schools open, our, our, our streets paved, and everything else? So to me, if I had a choice— I, we wouldn't have a TIF program in the city of Chicago because what we have what we've seen with the TIF program is that for years upon years upon decades, what's been what's been happening because, you know, TIFs are intended for blighted neighborhoods. They're supposed to go to places that need development, that need economic development. However, they've been going to ensuring that we can have these large high rise condos in communities that don't want them um, then going into investment into private businesses that are not like truly helping the communities that they're in. Uh, and so to me. They're, they're not functioning in the way that they were supposed to. However, we, that's the system that we live in right now. And if, if what, you know, what I'm a fan of, what I would like to see is I'm actually going to a community event right now after this in the 40th Ward on a, for a TIF surplus ordinance and, and trying to get that passed. And so what that would do, it would take exist, existing TIF funds and funnel them into Chicago public schools because that's where I think they, they would make the best investment because where TIFs come from is it's, it's our property taxes, but it's our property taxes that would go to our roads and our bridges and our schools. And so that's money that's being siphoned away from schools and then put into the hands of private businesses and to private enterprises. So in my opinion, those TIF funds should be going back to the public in a, in a way that is actually making lives better. And to me, that's Chicago Public Schools. Isn't it interesting that TIFs take money from the infrastructure and school budget so that it can give money to the infrastructure and school budget, at least on paper? Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, I it's... Mean, I mean, it's right now, it's yeah. a slush fund, very mm -hmm. obviously, but it's interesting that even in the way that they were rating out tips mm -hmm. it's like oh we're going to help these schools by taking money so we can give the money back yeah and you know that's again that's part of the neoliberal agenda it's it's in it, while the maybe the end goal is really to invest in infrastructure into schools we're doling it out to contractors we're doling it out to people who are friends of the friends of the mayor's administration friends of the city quote unquote and we're enriching them to help us rather than us using the money that we have to invest in the people that are already here. You were talking about, you know, uh, investing in, in kids to help them with, with computer skills on their own. We could do that. We could set up a program. We could have a city sponsored program that taught kids computer skills and got them to the point of, you know, having to have their own Amazon or having to, you know, uh, be extremely literate in, in, in technology and in coding and things like that. But instead... We're giving the money to private hands. Yeah, and, and again, at the end result, these large uh, law firms and these corporations and these buildings that are being uh, you know, supported by Mayor Emanuel and the TIF funds uh, basically pay zero dollars in tax or they're getting huge tax breaks. I mean, Amazon is going to get, if it comes here, it's going to get the biggest president of, uh, of all, zero uh, in, in tax taxation. Right, Daniel? Or something I believe bit? it's that the, if the taxes that would normally be paid by the workers to the city would go to Amazon instead. So it works out pretty much the same way. Wow, he comes off like a bandit. Again, corporate welfare in its in its prime, in its Amazon prime. I'd like oh. to say, it's like you have a DSA pin on it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that the U.S. is a CSA group. It's the Corporate Socialist <laughs> of America because if you don't have money, mm -hmm. we're happy to give it to you. Yeah. And uh, I think for our audience today, I think they're like, no, like, what organizations have uh, stepped up to, uh, you know, endorse you and uh, volunteer for your campaign? So right now we have uh, Loyola Young Democratic Socialists of America who have come out and supported the campaign extremely strong. You know, we've actually been able to incorporate them into the organizing work that we're doing on the in the 40th Ward. So they've actually been helping us lead uh, like canvassing workshops and things like that. And so we're pretty early on in the race. You know, we've got about like less than a year out to mm -hmm. before we uh before the, the actual election. And so, you know, we're not clamoring for endorsements right now because, you know, we want to show these organizations that, you know, we, we want to prove to them the work that we've been able to do over time. But, you know, uh, Loyola YDSA really jumped into the foray, foray to support us because they know um, we um, absolutely, you know, this is a Democratic Socialist campaign. And so, and I'm a member of Chicago Democratic Socialists of America myself. And so, the, you know, they could see themselves in this campaign. And um, it has been the uh, honor of my honor of my life to have them um, to have them their support and 
have them working with us. And so as time goes on, we'll be, of course, seeking the endorsements of uh, progressive organizations, working class organizations across the city of Chicago. And we have no doubt that um, we can work side by side to help co-govern, not just with the constituents in our ward, but also the organizations across the city of Chicago. And I want to ask you a two-part question. It's mm -hmm. our final question for this uh, first hour of Hard Lens Media. What do you want to say to the people who are still critical of getting involved politically or voting? And second, where, if someone is interested in volunteering for your campaign, where can they find you online and on social media? Mm -hmm. So to your first question, you know, for folks who are kind of jaded about politics, who don't, who don't want to be a part of it, who think it's like a, it's a nasty game, um, you know who does care about politics? Your boss cares about politics. You know who cares about politics? Your your elected officials care about politics. Your you know um, the, the the you know the the people who are controlling the strings of the way that your life runs care about politics. Your your um, your landlord, things like that. The people who have a direct impact on the way that you live your life are actively engaging in politics. And you know what they're doing? They're using it to their own self-interest. They're using it to make sure that the, the, the top 1% never have to pay a dime in taxes. They're using it to make sure that money gets siphoned away from Chicago public schools to investing in themselves. And they're making sure that you know, you know, folks can't find affordable housing across the city of Chicago. So to that I say, if you are not investing in politics, someone is investing in it for themselves to hurt you. And so I think that every single person in this city, especially working class folks, especially progressive people, should get involved in politics because we need your help to build a true political revolution that works for the working class in the city of Chicago. So please, you need to get involved. And if you're interested in being a part of our campaign, you can hit, um, you can hit us up at ugo2019.com. Um, you can find us at, on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, Ugo Carry 40 um, at Ugo Carry 40 You can find us on all the, on all the major um, social media sites. I also want to uh, say as a last thing, it's very similar to what we've said on the show, that mm -hmm. it's, if you're not designing the menu, you're on the plate. Mm -hmm. And politics is nothing more than humans deciding how to organize power. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not deciding what your role in that power is, someone's deciding it for you. Absolutely. And Ugo Carey, I just want to thank uh, you so much for joining our show. All the best to you on your campaign. Um, it's really good to hear where you stand on these issues, and hopefully um, 2019 will be a little bit different than how this primary turned out on March 20th, that there will be active voter involvement and that people will be angry enough and energized enough to get actively involved because, as stated before, there's lead in our water and there's so much other issues that we have to address in this city. So, again, thank you for being on our show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Kit. And uh, for anyone who's watching us on YouTube, Facebook, or listening to us on Q4Radio.org or 1680 AM, uh, you can learn more about Hard Lens Media at our website, www.hardlensmedia.com, H-A-R-D-L-E-N-S-M-E-D-I-A.com. And if you like what we do, we have a Patreon page to all our Patreon supporters you guys are keeping this ship afloat. Uh, without you guys, we wouldn't be able to produce this content, have these guests on our show, or do so much more. So if you like what we do, any amount of donation helps us out so that we can actually have strong, independent media here in the city of Chicago, Cook County, and Illinois. So peace, everyone, and we'll see you in the second hour. We are back. Welcome to the second hour of Hard Lens Media. You can check us out on 1680 AM, q4radio.org, or you can watch us on our Facebook page, or on our YouTube channel. So, uh, that being said, uh, I want to give a huge shout out to our first guest, Ugo Carey, for joining us in the first hour. Uh, clearly, uh, 2019 will be a very interesting uh, year uh, for uh, for municipal elections here in the city of Chicago. And on top of that, too, I also want to give a really big shout out to another group that's hosting an event on Wednesday, uh, April 25th. And that is the 12th IPO. They'll be hosting uh, an event that's dealing with a lot of issues that's affecting that district here in the city of Chicago. So check out the 12th IPO uh, Facebook page so you can learn more about the event on April 25th. Uh, that being said, we are going to cover a story that's right now affecting a lot of people from independent YouTube channels like ourselves to uh, numerous other groups. And that's this DNC lawsuit as well as the corporate media that's beating the drum saying that um, the reason why we are in the current state of, as we are is because of uh, uh, independent YouTube channels and their misinformation. As we all know, we've, we've seen quite recently uh, Chicago's very own Jimmy Dore was attacked by corporate media establishment network CNN. And they were basically accusing him of 
uh, instigating, uh, you know, anti-Hillary stories, uh, and, you know, be, being uh, in this not, spe- not, not, not falling in, in line with, 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 case, with the corporate in Democrats. In this specific case, it's that he questioned the reliability of taking the Pentagon at their word that chemical attacks took place in Syria, which is exactly yeah, what we the, spoke the, about and, the, well, last week. It's what – uh, representatives like uh, what's his name, Rand Paul have uh, yeah, Rand Paul have talked about. Yeah, and also not to mention too, like uh, you know, House Representative, uh, um, U.S. House Representative Tulsi Gabbard has also questioned the Syrian gas bombings. Um, you know, you know the, as, the, the, as MSN yeah. would call yeah. traitors to the country. And not to mention Senator Bernie Sanders has also questioned out those uh, Syrian gas attacks as well. But the thing is, every time you do so, the corporate media establishment as well as the military industrial complex as well as a two party political establishment will then jump to say, No, no, you're you're betraying everyone. You you're you're not falling in line. We need to go to war right away and let's look how that turned out in Iraq. And so oh, wait, we, before you before you jump yeah. into Iraq, because this yeah. is this is about the lawsuit and I know. this is about Jimmy Dore. So Jimmy Dore's case, he was hit by being grouped together with neo Nazis as yeah. Oh, he's a far left agitator yeah. for bringing up exactly what we spoke about last night, what people in the government have said for the last while, few people, granted. And at the same time, remember, uh, we went to war in the Spanish-American War by blaming the main on Spain. Um, I mean, if we look at all the re- previous wars that we've been in, the recent ones with Iraq, oh, they have WMDs. It turns out they didn't. Uh, oh, the Dol- Gulf of Tonkin, they hit us with a torpedo. We should go to war in Vietnam. Turns yeah. out they didn't. Oh, uh, these people did this thing. It turns out they didn't. Oh, they did that thing. Oh, Libya is going to do these actions. Turns out there's a live slave market there. And now, so who's the enemy? The reality is that there's two things going on. You have a block, a group block of people. Mm -hmm. You have the Democratic Party and their keys to power, which would include— And their neoliberal backers. Which are one and the same, which are keys to power. Mm -hmm. And you have the news. You have MSN. CNN. You You have that block together doing uh what it does best and who are their enemies well you have the independent media that's challenging the entire narrative they've built up for 40 years or actually i should say with msn's bill since bill clinton signed the 1996 telecommunications act which enabled both msn and fox to exist Mm -hmm. but take that away this is nothing more than Okay, so let's just go back to the other point. Yeah, and so, there's one thing I really want okay, to add on there it. because, like, Jimmy Dore was on Lee Camp's show, Redacted Tonight, and they are both basically indicating just what's wrong with our corporate media as well as our two party establishment. Look, attacking Lee Camp or Jimmy Dore or any other independent media outlet goes to show you how out of touch the corporate media is. And on top it's of not that, about, it has nothing yeah. to do with being out of touch at no, all. No, this, but, no, no, no. This is Jimmy Dore and Lee Camp say factual issues that have to do with how media portrays information and the media as a response smears them yeah, that's I, the game I, I know i know and I, and I just i just want to add on to it too it's just it goes to show you also why people are lo- moving away from the corporate media narrative and why people are now flocking to people like jimmy Dore, lee camp or even our show about like and people want to know what's really affecting them now they they're tired of being spoon-fed this corporate media crap all the time, and now more than ever, I think there there has to be a change because since that 1996 Telecom Act, I think we've we've become more ill informed. We've gone from yeah. hundreds and thousands of media companies to, to like six, five, six, six now. Well, oh. it's, it's been six. Oh, it's, it's, been six. it's um well, it, kind of, it does change around. So like it used to be GE, but now it's Comcast that owns MSN. Oh, remember, wow. remember, remember, this is the kind of business that who we're fighting against. GE buys MSNBC. MSNBC during the Iraq war says the war is perfect. Everyone needs to go to war. There's no reason we shouldn't be in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Everyone who doesn't agree with that, you're being let go. You're fired. MSN is a, in that time, a, the media arm of GE, one of the largest defense contractors in the world. Whereas right now, Comcast who owns a lot of television, owns MSN, and MSN and Comcast are both natural competitors of Google and YouTube. Yeah. So that's what this is. And so now I want to jump to this lawsuit. because, we, because As much as Jimmy Dore is a very good example of how this works, right now at the same time we also have a lawsuit, which I'm going to call the Sue Everyone lawsuit, where the uh, they're actually taking a, a page out of what happened with uh, – Nixon, when he was uh, uh, being taken down, 
And back then they got like $750,000. I'm not sure what that turns into for inflation, but my guess is a lawsuit like this is going to cost more in lawyer fees than yeah. it's going to uh, gain. I'm not really sure what they want. Do they want a piece of paper that says, hey, a court in a civil suit said we were right about the hacking because we can't currently prove that hacking existed, which they should be waiting for Mueller. Why are they putting all this effort into putting a lawsuit together when they should be putting the same amount into trying to get a law passed, even though I know they're trying to fight McConnell on it right now to keep Mueller from being fired by um, uh, uh, um, by Trump. So this is this is just – it's such a dumb lawsuit. They're, okay, so let me go into her. They're, they're, they're trying to sue Russia. They're suing uh, everyone that's related to Donald Trump. They're not suing Donald Trump himself. They're suing uh, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Julian Assange, anyone that they perceived as being negative. So again, this is – I've been trying to think of a good metaphor for this for a while. I think now is the time to use it. It's like you have a house kit yeah, and you okay. go into – and you have your house and it's furnished with whatever you furnish your house with. Wouldn't it be nice if we both had – if we had an economy where that was uh, not a sarcastic. Oh, man, that would be where great. Where we actually had – okay, but, dude, anyway, but dude, anyway. You just made me cry a little so, on the inside. So what happens is you make a deal. You have uh, five corporations that come up to you and say, hey, we're going to get you into the aldermanic seat. But uh, you got to sign some stuff away. And so you sign some papers. And so the corporations go into your house and they just start taking all of your furniture out. And then you decide to start burning some other – you know, you do terrible things – and it's going to – and people are like, well, you just sold out to corporations. They're literally taking your couch away. And then the guy next door, who in this case we'll call Russia, goes in and like puts some Russian dolls on the floor mm-hmm. and puts like a little Russian flag in like a cup that you have left. Mm-hmm. And so then when you lose the election, you go back into your house and you go, Russia did all this. Look at the evidence they've left behind. That's exactly what happened in the election. If so many things could have been done correctly, the only reason that Russia was able to do what they do, which again is something that every nation does. The U.S. is the best at overthrowing countries. We're the heavyweight champions. We're the heavyweight champions and we're yelling at a runner-up. But if you take all that and you say, okay, well, this would have been irrelevant if a good candidate had been there. And even if Hillary Clinton made herself a better candidate, if she had, I don't know, visited Wisconsin, if she had, I don't know, visited Michigan, if she had not doubled down, tripled down, quadrupled down on Trans-Pacific Partnership at the same time she was defending TPP at the same time. Do you remember that girl that she kicked out of a private meeting because she was pro-Black Lives Matter? It's as if she shot someone that she needed to run her campaign and then blamed Russia for the shot. This entire lawsuit is so absurd. It, yeah. Even if they win it, it, my point is it's not about whether the actual tenants of the lawsuit have merit. It's the Democrats need to get over themselves. They need to stop blaming the 5% of things they couldn't control while ignoring the 95% of things they could. Uh, real quick, because I, I know this this is loosely connected to it, but I wonder if the Democratic establishment is ever going to look into the election fraud that the DNC establishment and Clinton campaign did during the 2016 primary that denied Bernie Sanders uh, the nomination. Because at the end of the day, we have to look at Hillary Clinton as a candidate as well as the DNC establishment as an organization because let's face it, there was a lot of shady stuff that was happening in every single state primary and no one's bringing that up. Or either that, there are some independent media outlets that are bringing it up, but it's not really being acknowledged. Because, let's face it, the Clinton campaign failed miserably. They thought they had this election in the bag, and they kept on doubling down on their neoliberal policies, ignoring the issues, and at the same time, too, separating themselves from potential independent and progressive voters that could have actually voted for Hillary Clinton. And let's, let's ignore the fact that she won the popular vote. We don't live in that country. We have a primitive antiquated system which is called the electoral college and i don't know what the clinton campaign and dnc establishment were thinking when they were campaigning what they should have done was double down in some in some key blue states in order to get the correct electoral vote but no they didn't they kept on being arrogant she had tim kane a corporate wall street neoliberal candidate and at the same time too when wall street threatened her clinton that is of picking elizabeth warren as her vp she said no 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 one's going to tell me what to do and then the next few weeks later she picks tim kane as vp and it turns out she had picked him months beforehand yeah. because of a political deal so elizabeth warren was really already moved. A joke. and then and, and blaming russia 
for the uh, like for, said, for the election, and then even blaming uh, Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party or Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party. Those two did not contribute to anything to her defeat. So I think what this really comes down to again with this lawsuit, which it just so it's so childish in every way, shape, or form. It's so it says to me they haven't really changed at all because here you have it. Bernie's already moving on. He's the guy that was actually uh, uh, screwed over, and that's provable. You have again. We know the Russians did stuff, and they uh, they published stuff. They spent a few hundred thousand dollars on ads, but it was such a drop in a bucket that if you had an actually good campaign, it would have been irrelevant. Like in all previous years before, it's what is it? It's like um, it's very hard to die by a uh, a pinprick. I don't know. It just, it's, just, it's just terrible. It's just childish. And the Democrats who already don't have enough money to run their campaign don't need to be launching uh, lawsuits that are going to take years to litigate to the point that by the time Trump is either already impeached or already out of office in 2020, let's assume it goes that way, that this would it, – it's just this entire thing, the entire – who they're, who they're attacking – this is just an attack on people that don't hold the mantra. They're, they're attacking it's a simultaneous attack. So you have Jimmy Doors being attacked. At the same time, this is this is a coordinated attack, or at least it very much appears to be a coordinated attack. When they, in reality, what the Democratic Party needs to do is they need to start saying, "Okay, we failed in every which way, shape, or form. Our own voters don't even know what we stand for. Beyond our own voters not knowing what they stand for." We don't have anything that we stand for as issues. The only thing that Democrats stand for is that they are the lesser of two evils. That's what their platform is, that we're, hey, we're like them, but we're not as bad. So this is them – I don't – I just – I just – this is just – I never expected them to put this out. I never expected them to say, oh, look at this. We're going to put out a lawsuit for something that's already happened a year ago that they're not going to do anything against. They have lost. Mm -hmm. They lost because of their own incompetence, and there was a little bit of assistance from outside forces. And they're trying to pin, like, at most, if you were incredibly – if you just say Russia is a really powerful country, which it isn't. It's a very irrelevant country that just happens to have a lot of nukes and happens to used to be relevant. This is just – it's just the Democratic Party's inability to accept reality, to accept where reality is taking them, the kinds of policies they need to do, and the fact that they would have to leave their donor base, which they are all elected to be there for. This is as um, is as uh, bad a move. It's, it's exactly what – it shows the same thing that's happened on the Republican side – where Trump is losing his own support and they're trying to hold it together as best they can. This is the Democrats trying to hold it together as best they can. But I don't see how this will hold people, hold anything together. You know, you know, this, this concerns me for the 2018 uh, midterm election cycle because, look, here in Illinois, the primary is over. We have our candidates who they, who, you know, they are who they are right now. But it's also important uh, for anyone who lives in other states that have primaries coming up. Look at the progressive and independent candidates that are running, that are challenging these current neoliberal establishment Democrats. Uh, if we, if you want reform, now is the time to get actively involved, volunteer, and spread the word. Because let's say the Democrats have this blue wave in the midterm and they have the Senate and House. Okay, what are you guys going to do? Because you just can't hold on to 2016 for forever and ever and ever. You're going to sound like the Republicans spewing out Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. Did it go anywhere? No. And, and, is, and is this 2016 a lawsuit going to go anywhere? No, because people are going to move on. And plus, many progressives, independents, and Democrats are going to remember that, oh, wait, the DNC establishment was working with the Clinton campaign from the very beginning, committing election fraud, rigging voting machines, and, take, and doing voter purges during that primary. And then all of a sudden, when the primary was over, what a miracle. Everyone all of a sudden could be Democrat again. You were back, you were back there. You got your voter ID. You, you're, you're back again. No, people are not going to forget that. If the DNC establishment wants to hold on to 2016, the voting populace and those who were supporting Bernie Sanders are never going to forget it either. And if you think they're going to fall in line because Trump says some horrible things and is, and is an incompetent uh, president, well, yeah, that's true. Trump is who he is. That shouldn't surprise anybody. But at the same time, too, Democratic establishment, when you have people like Nancy Pelosi screaming that, oh, we shouldn't give Trump more power. He's, he's a threat. He's a threat. And then what does she do at the next day? She increases the uh, she, she votes in favor of the Surveillance Act. 
what, Nancy Pelosi, are you a hypocrite? Are, are, are you are you are you aware of just how out of touch the, the entire Democratic establishment is? And plus, the Democratic establishment, you guys have been losing government hey, seats, Ken, uh, Senate remember, seats, uh, remember, you know, state level seats. Do you remember when the uh, the Bernie Kratz sued the DNC because the DNC was uh, had exactly as you said rigged their primary? And the DNC's defense was basically, yeah, well, we could smoke cigars in the back room and pick them. It doesn't really matter. YOLO. And that, and the press was like, oh, that's such a non-story. No one listened to this story. Let's not even talk about this lawsuit. Mm-hmm. It only got covered like once or twice and, and dismissively. Like, oh, these poor people who didn't know what they were doing lost this. The thing that gets me is it's one thing if this lawsuit happened in certain ways. This is just – Pure hypocrisy. And there's not if there's one thing in life mm-hmm. I can't stand, it is rotten hypocrisy. That but, they got but Daniel, at the their Democrats are doing a good job. They're doing a good job of giving Trump everything that he wants and not really resisting. They're giving him everything he wants in regards to giving him more war powers and surveillance powers. I mean and and so and so when you hear um when you hear that uh you know they're going to uh you know sue everyone and just blame Russia, it's it's like really are are you, are are you guys can you guys not let it go? It's like again they're 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 suing the five percent they couldn't control, but ignoring the ninety five percent that they could. So it's a shame. Uh, you know, I wish that they would just get over it. It was they dug their own grave. Again, someone helped with one or two shovelfuls, but it could have never happened unless they dug the rest of it for themselves. And if it's up to them to get out of that hole, make policies that people like. Now, my question is, if the Democrats get this power back, they've already said that they don't want to uh, impeach Trump, which is uh, their entire talking point before that. And I now went under. So, like, so wait, you, you, are you telling me that the Democratic establishment's not going to mm-hmm. follow through on what they said? No. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. It's it's such a shock. For for, for Minter, you had me concerned. Yeah. There, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So you have like we were talking earlier, Chuck Schumer is introducing this bill to legalize marijuana. I wonder, once he's in power, if he will have the same, um, you know, has the ability to make that bill happen, and if, I, he has the abil- if he wants to still push it through, and or I if it's wa- just and, when and he I, can't. And I wonder if the Democratic establishment at the national level, level if cannabis is legalized, because we're going back to the story on the first hour, are they going to think about the people who are in jail for nonviolent crimes or holding a bag of cannabis? I mean, come on, guys. I mean... I, there's going to come a point where everyone, Democratic voters, Republican voters, independent voters, are going to get tired of this two-party neoliberal corporate establishment. It's, it seems that for, for a long time uh, they just you know want to have um, their cake and eat it too. So yeah. here, here, here's the issue. Here, here's the issue that, 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 that I want everyone to remember. If you're upset at this current system, if you are upset at how things are being run, now is the time for you – uh, to get actively involved into our democracy. Now is the time for you to step up because if you don't, you're going to get more people like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and anyone else who's part of the two-party neoliberal establishment. They're all friends. Remember, Goldman Sachs was supporting both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Do you think the people at Goldman Sachs who were supporting Hillary Clinton were somehow better than the Goldman Sachs execs that were supporting Donald Trump? No. It's one big game, and none of us are invited to it. So if we want to bring in real reform, real change, we – as voters, as citizens, need to step up and get involved and hold these elected officials, whether they're at the state level or federal level, accountable. Daniel? And at this point, we actually have an example of someone we're about to speak to on yes. that note. Yes, exactly. I am proud to introduce uh, Illinois State Representative Letissa Wallace uh, to our show. All of you who may not remember, she was also the lieutenant governor candidate with the uh, Daniel Biss campaign, Illinois State Senator Daniel Biss. Illinois State Representative Letissa Wallace, thank you so much for joining Hardlands Media. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. We are really glad to have you on. Uh, so essentially, for our audience, can you give an introduction to who you are and what made you get involved in Illinois politics? Because I think for a long time, when we look at Illinois politics, we see corruption um, you know, uh, and just really neoliberalism policies being passed here in the state. Well, um, so I've been a state legislator for about four years. Um, I'm a mom who was working for my predecessor. The goal at the time of taking the position to run that district office was to finish my dissertation and go on and maybe be in higher ed at some point. Um, The goal was not necessarily to become the state legislator for uh, the 67th district, but Mm -hmm. it happened when he retired. Um, 
I threw my name in the hat. I ultimately was the person appointed. And uh, for the last few years, I've spent uh, working to push back against some of the harmful policies that we've seen other, under the current administration, which is really the only administration I've um, served you know, with or under. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've tried to push for um, values and all the progressive things that really working families need to make our lives easier to make our communities better. That's what what my mission has been for the last few years. Now, of course, being a state representative in Springfield, I think a lot of people uh, are wondering what Springfield's going to do in regards to helping them. Because let's face it, for two years, there was a fight between the House Speaker, Michael Madigan, and our current governor, uh, uh, Bruce Rauner. And during that two-year budgetary crisis, a lot of programs and uh, you know resources that people need to use or to have the state functioning uh, were being denied. So essentially, what are you doing right now to really help out the people who are in Illinois? Because Illinois is also dealing with another crisis, and that is people are leaving our state in mass. Um, so I've been pushing to uh, fund the programs that were being cut or that were having to close their doors because the two-year, six-day budget impasse that occurred – um, just yesterday, I passed a bill to bring stabilization to the child care assistance program. It kind of became my issue by accident um, mm-hmm. a few years ago when I shared the fact that I had had to use those programs to mm-hmm. be able to provide for my own child and get to work and do the things necessary to raise a young family. Um, but I've been on the front line of standing up for individuals who receive services for uh, direct care, the community care program. For seniors who are needing, um, whether it's home health care or Meals on Wheels, I've been right at the forefront of calling out this current administration for not funding in his proposed unbalanced budgets, but also calling out the fact that the state has flatly funded those programs for over a decade, actually close to 15 years at this point, those things have been flatly funded. And it's resulted in devastation and the two year, six year, uh, two year, six day budget impasse only demolished what was already crumbling and falling apart. And uh, how often do people like right now use those uh, resources? Because I I only can imagine that during that budgetary crisis, you know, you had a lot of families and people who uh, maybe had some disabilities really struggled to survive. Uh, what, what have they said to you in regards to really keeping these programs afloat so that, you know, they could still be in the state and at the same time to contribute? Absolutely. To, yeah. um, well, I've heard I actually had one constituent reach out to me via email and say that they had to move uh, a disabled individual moved to Iowa because they could access services easier. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, the city of Rockford is um, about 90 miles west of Chicago. We're very close to Wisconsin's border as well as not too far from Iowa's border. Mm-hmm. So we have people who are leaving. Um, but I've heard devastating stories. And that's why I've always voted to try to fund um, those human services that individuals need. I vice chair the human services committee. So I hear week after week testimony from individuals who are living this. This is not some number on a spreadsheet for them. The the money for these programs is really, for some people, the difference between um, living independently and living in some institution or um, life and literal death. And so I've worked as hard as I can to scrape by whatever funding we can um, piece together over those years that we have the impasse. And we're right now in the budget making process. And I'll continue to echo the voices of those who need those programs. Okay, and also let's let's also look at another thing too. Uh, when it comes to governing and addressing the budgetary crisis that happened, um, was there a potential of being a new Illinois government? How do we avoid another budgetary crisis? Let's say, for example, should Bruce Rauner um, become governor again? How do we avoid that? Because it seems to me that um, no matter who wins, Illinois still is going to be recovering from that aftermath. And if Bruce Rauner is to become our governor again. Uh, how do we avoid another showdown between him and Madigan? Absolutely. Well, if he becomes governor again, he will be more emboldened than he has been for the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, so that means it's incumbent upon us to work as hard as we can to make sure that that does not happen. So mm-hmm. I hope that's step one. But step two, should that nightmare um, become a reality, what will have to happen is the masses, individuals in everybody's district, will have to say that this is what we need you to support and vote for in the legislature, and we need you to then push back 
even if the governor vetoes it. It's going to take um, the citizens within districts that tend not to vote for funding for various programs to push their legislators to do so. Now, let's look, let's look at the election that happened during the primary, and it's been over a month since the March 20th primary. Uh, what were the initial challenges that you saw when you were running, and what lessons can progressives and independents learn when they are taking on establishment Democrats? Because as of right now, J.B. Pritzker, he's the nominee, so going forward, he'll be going into the general election, challenging Bruce Rauner. So what can we learn? What lessons have we learned from that uh, primary? Well, the sad thing is I don't think we learned from 2016 – um, well, just how important and what the role of money is in our politics. Um, I would hope that this last primary, unfortunately, um, I'll say, unfortunately, this last primary taught us that the role of money is so huge and so massive that it can drown out almost anything. I hope that moving forward, though, we realize that principle is great, Mm -hmm. Um, having values are, you know, that we are willing to literally die on the sword for is absolutely great. But until we have comprehensive campaign finance reform, we're going to have to put all our pennies together and say, this is who we're getting behind and we need to make this happen. Um, and I literally mean pennies if it, if it comes down to that. Now, of, of course, knowing that J.B. Pritzker is going to be going into the general election, uh, what concerns do you have in regards to his campaign reaching out to potential voters? Because let's face it, um, while the Democratic turnout was much higher than the Republican turnout during the primary, uh, 3% of young people turned out to vote during the primary. So what, what concerns do you have uh, for this general election? Because if it's two billionaires, I think a lot of people may be turned off or turned away from actually getting involved. And at the same time, that can also hurt a lot of the other you know, candidates that are running in various other districts. Right. So I think what has to happen is um, I think the JB camp is going to have to make concerted efforts to court um, the rest of the voters who supported Daniel Biss and I, um, those who supported Chris Kennedy and Rod Joy. There's going to have to be a concentrated, concerted, consistent effort to engage those voters and to engage them in um, this process. Otherwise, we will face um, a general election that will be a nail biter. And I don't think that we want to go into October and November still trying to figure out what's going to happen. Um, and then the, the other thing I would say in terms of courting um, young adults, we have to give them a reason. You know, we have to spell out what their future would look like based upon the policies of um, the two candidates and how does that connect with their everyday life? That's the only way you're going to get young voters to really get involved. So you've been, I've been working with uh, um, Pritzker's campaign. Uh, you and Biss, everyone else has, you know, there's help for the final push to get into the general. What do you see as changes that he's either in the process of making or considering that he hasn't done already that would uh, be very beneficial and to both uh, the, the progressive movement and simultaneously, like you said, bringing out younger voters and more progressive voters? Well, I have not been working with the Pritzker <clears throat> excuse me, campaign. Um, that has not happened yet. I think m maybe in the future there will be conversations and discussions. I, I hope that happens um, sooner rather than later, but as of now, um, I'm not, has he not reached out to in you? that process. Um, I've in, been in contact with his staff. Um, and I'm in, currently in legislative session, so it makes my okay. schedule a little bit more difficult. But it is my hope that we'll have a discussion about the progressive values that Senator Biss and I put forth throughout the state <clears throat> that a large number of people support it. Um, and how can those um, core platforms and those core policy issues become part of what moves into the discussion for the general election? Okay. All right. And – also, what are the necessary steps to really have voter engagement? Because turnout during the primary was low, so how do we actually bring them all out to really get actively involved and actually to be there at the at the ballot to cast their vote? Because I think there's still a lot of criticism uh, towards uh, this election system that we have. Oh, there's a lot of criticism. I mean, if you think about the average 21-year-old, let's say, 
<clears throat> in our nation, they've now seen several election cycles where the person who they supported the most um, and who might have actually even had the popular vote didn't win um, at the national level. And then they've also seen now at the state level um, an individual with a ton of uh, millennial support still not uh, winning the um, gubernatorial election or the nomination for um, Democratic gubernatorial candidates. So we're going to have to be very hands-on, again, making sure that there's a clear connection between their everyday life and the policies that will be decided upon by the people who will be elected. Um, I don't think that we always make that personal pitch and connection to individuals and certainly not to young adults. Now, there are many progressives and independents that are still critical of the Illinois Democratic Party and of many of the key leaders, too. For example, Speaker of the House Michael Madigan. Uh, for the general election, what can this current Democratic uh, do to take these key seats and be part of the blue wave? And uh, will the Democratic establishment's uh, candidates still be able to hold on to uh, these progressive policies that people want to happen uh, to, to get passed? I mean, can they, you know, can can this can this can this currently uh, Democratic Party really push forward progressive policies? I think there is a lot of messaging around that. Mm -hmm. um, however, your discussion, as I was coming in, I think is very key. I think. Um, there is a tendency to be complacent when we do have so many Democrats in office. There's a tendency to not fight as hard and to push as hard. And I think we have to be very clear that there are several um, factions within the Democratic Party, and not everyone who says they're progressive is truly progressive. Um, so I, I kind of made a post about that yesterday on my social media. You know, you'll know them by their fruits. It's a, an adage from the Bible, but it's true. You have to look at what are the outcomes of the policies that these individuals have pushed for years, or what are the potential outcomes of the things that a newcomer is saying they will do? Does it really line up with what we believe to be core progressive values? Um, so we're going to have to stay on individuals just because they have a D behind their name doesn't mean we just sit back and allow them to push forth policies that may not be consistent with our progressive values. So in your own words and experience, what would you what do you what do you think differentiates a or an actual progressive from either someone who's saying they are or someone that just considers themselves neoliberal? Well, I, again, it's their actions, right? What have you been pushing for that is part of a progressive platform for whether it's in the private sector, whether it's the volunteerism you've done over your lifetime, maybe you are an elected official and have had the opportunity to put forth ideas and policies that are consistent with progressivism. Um, we have to look to see what is that. Um, it's very easy to say this is what I should, could, and would do. Um, particularly if you're an individual who doesn't have a record. But I think you can look at, um, we could take one issue of the graduated or progressive income tax. Um, that's something that people in the legislature, outside the legislature, have been working on, hoping to have for year upon year upon year. Um, however, there are some people that maybe weren't in that fight before now. Um, so you could pick kind of your own litmus test and see where has that person or those people been over the course of time that that issue was something important mm -hmm. to you and to the public. And and so when, when we look at these establishment Democrats, um, essentially what concerns do you have like when a progressive candidate uh, endorses a establishment candidate? We've seen it here happen here in Illinois as well as in a few other states to where okay, this is a progressive candidate that I like, but now all of a sudden he's endorsing, he or she is endorsing an establishment Democrat who's been part of the problem for a very long time. I think we all kind of know what's happening with uh, the Garcia campaign endorsing uh, Michael Madigan. It shouldn't come to a surprise because he was, you know, uh, you know they, they were both kind of, you know, endorsing each other mm -hmm. early on during the primary. But then how, how, do you, how do we really address that situation? Well, yeah, endorsements are tricky. Um, obviously, you have a particular goal, which is no matter what faction of the Democratic Party you're a part of, you do want your party to win. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that sometimes there has to be that compromise, but I think that it's still incumbent upon you know, the public and, and the voters to hold people accountable, to not just sit back after um, elections happen or after they've cast their ballot and assume 
that that person who has said they're progressive is going to follow through with those things. Um, and I think when we're giving out endorsements as individuals who consider themselves progressive, we have to say, these are the things that I want to see happen. These are the things that myself and my supporters are going to hold you accountable for. And if you are okay with that accountability, then I can grant that endorsement. But we shouldn't just give out endorsements just because. And and so when we look at um, in this day and age of Me Too and Time's Up, um, there's, of course, has been a huge uh, situation in Springfield in regards to it being a safe environment for women. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a possibility at all to really – eventually bring in the type of reform to keep that, you know, to end the kind of harassment towards women and actually have them be more of a, a stronger political force here in this country? Because it seems like there's there's always to be a barrier stopping women from becoming actively involved or either that uh, make there's always an environment of hostility towards them. Well, you know, it's a systemic issue, right? Um, it's something that has been happening for centuries. Mm-hmm. Um, the harassment is rooted in sexism. Um, And sexism is all about power and oppression. And as long as there are some people who are completely kept out of um, the decision-making process, um, as long as there are some people who hold the bulk of the power, there will be some form of ism happening. So what has to happen is I think men have to use their privilege um, and be able to echo what women are saying and work with us to start to change that sexism that occurs, that that creates the perfect environment for the harassment. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a woman of color, we've also got to have white allies and male allies to come together and lift their voice about racism. Um, because oftentimes the type of gender discrimination that women of color experience is also racialized. Um, and so we have to be able to address those things and it's going to take allies to do that. So this is something I was kind of bounced around in my head. I want to get uh, your thought on it. So right now in Springfield, granted there are some new people coming in, which is really nice. It's a really good change of pace. But just like nationally and in other states, uh, a very large portion of who is actually there are older white men. And my question is, and this may sound a slight bit more, but I don't, I don't intend it to be, Will it take for these individuals to die off before that there is a vacuum that's created where this better um, discussion can happen with actually different people, younger people, or whatever it may come out to? Or are these individuals going to be brought to the correct line where they really change the sexism or they, uh, they change the racism or however that works? Where do you see that working, and I guess just within uh, Springfield? Well, that's a good question. Um, You would hope that as older generations um, move on, that the next generation will actually be more open-minded. But actually, there's some studies that suggest otherwise. Um, Because, again, we are mirroring or um, actually acting upon things that we've been taught by the previous generation. So it's going to take active, um, vigilant discussion, around recognizing the racism, recognizing the sexism, race, recognizing biases, and trying to actively push to move away from that. Um, and I think that's the case no matter how old you are. You're going to have to address those things and um, hopefully push for more equity and equality. All right. And now we have also looked at another issue that's really affecting Illinois, and that's the segregation and discrimination towards like a lot of these communities of working class people and communities of color. Um, how are we going to really break this hyper segregation that's really affecting this entire state? And uh, you know, what kind of what kind of movement will it take to really organize effective power to end the, the segregation and discrimination towards all the all the communities here in the state of Illinois? Because it's it's it seems prevalent and it's, and it also seems at the same time too those people in Springfield are just turning a blind eye to it or just going to assume that things will get better over time if they just, you know, just give half measures instead of full measures? Oh, that's a a wonderful question. Um, I've often stated that you have to be as intentional with policies to destroy the disparities um, as we were intentional with policies that created those disparities. So Mm -hmm. generations before us put Uh, policies in place that created the segregation you see. You saw redlining. You saw unfair hiring practices. You um, you continue to see that. You continue to see 
um, individuals not earning as much as others, depending upon what their race or gender, or if you're lucky, your race and your gender, um, there are going to have to be intentional policies put in place to undo that. Now, that's where, again, people and voters come into play, pushing legislators, pushing policymakers to make certain decisions. Um, I've seen time and time again when there are bills that seem to be specific to women or specific to um, the black community, specific to the Hispanic community, you will have people pull their vote from those bills. That's when we need to look at those roll calls and we need to be calling those legislators and we need to be saying, you have to be intentional about these things to undo what was already intentionally set into motion. Mm. That's a very good uh, note to really uh, you know, mention up on because it's, it's, it's quite clear that you know, here in Illinois, it's, it's, it's a long set history of discrimination and racism. And um, even though this is a quote unquote blue state, um, racism and segregation is alive and well. We've seen it firsthand here in the city of Chicago. And in the first hour, we covered how in a lot of the low-income minority communities, uh, working-class communities, that there's lead in our water. And it's and the reason for it is because of lack of investment into infrastructure, into uh, communities. And it's, if it's not, if it's even happening here in a major city like Chicago, same kind of crisis that's happening in Flint, Michigan. I can imagine what's happening into the other counties all across Illinois. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in, in the long run, I think as as we're nearing the end of our uh, second hour, mm-hmm. I think a, a lot of our viewers and subscribers maybe want to learn more about you, or perhaps volunteer with you, or stand with you when you protest or hold yes, a town hall. Yeah. Where can they learn more about your uh, about your? I was going to say campaign. Uh, where can they learn more about you? Follow you online, social media, yeah. and at the same time too, what do you want to say to people that are very critical of our system and refuse to get involved? Well, I I feel like you have lost the right to criticize if you won't get involved to make it better and to change it into what you'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can find me on social media. Um, Almost every platform is at Letisa Wallace. So it's Mm -hmm. L-I-T-E-S-A-W-A-L-L-A-C-E. My website is LatisaWallace.com. But yes, usually just my name um, on any social media platform. You can plug in and catch up with me. All right. Well, that's a very good note to end it on. Illinois State Representative Letitia Wallace, it was a real uh, privilege to speak to you and and have you on our uh, show. Uh, First and foremost, another shout out to our our first guest, uh, Ugo Carey, who joined us in the first hour. Uh, Clearly, uh, if you guys like what we do here at Heartlands Media, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, or listening to us on Q4 Radio, uh, you know you can learn more about Heartlands Media on our website, H-E-R-D-L-E-N-S-M-E-D-I-A. And if you like what we do, we have a Patreon page. Your support is the main heart and backbone to what we do here. It allows us to produce more content, have all these guests on our show, and to keep this show afloat. Uh, let's build a strong, independent media here in this city, and let's all do what we can to build a better future. Peace, everyone.